For, he's giving us a signal. <laughs> the signal's on. So guys, there's something, uh, it's a new phenomenon that I like to call live YouTube-itis. I don't know if you guys have noticed it or not, but with this whole live dynamic, people are trying to get people to come in. So, you know, it starts at a certain time. So they'll like, uh, yeah, and uh, mm, Oh yeah, uh, are we on? Uh, and they start doing different things. So um, I, it's kind of like the mic check. You guys have all spoken at churches, the whole mic check. He used to work for us. Mike Check. Mike. Oh, yeah. Mike, Mike Checks. <laughs> I think was his name. Mike Knox. But no, like Mike Checks, they drive me insane because it's the typical uh, check one, two, uh, check, check, uh, check, 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 check. You one, don't two. do that, though. I don't. I recite a poem. Yeah. And it gives them a nice, steady flow, like my creation poem. Who can tell me where I came oh, from? Oh, we're starting with that? Yeah, should we? <laughs> No. But Ray, oh, that reminded me. But remember when we were in New Zealand and um, I started to recite one of my poems to one of your aunts? Yes. And she was answering the questions. She didn't understand. What uh, is it that you hope in? Is it riches? Is it fame? She was saying, no. The no. 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 I, no, I, no. They don't have poetry <laughs> in you know, New Zealand. Speaking of no. that, <laughs> often I watch a movie where someone will sing to someone else from a, like a foot away and I think, how difficult would that be to stand there and watch someone sing at you? Well, Oh, please don't. I always thought it was an, I always thought it was impressive in West Side Story. They sing, dance, and fight all at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> West Side Story. <laughs> da, 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 da. Mix it up. <laughs> well, we are here, guys. And uh, rather than droning on and doing our thing, uh, you're here with us. Let's see what we got here. We got friends. Oh, we got a bunch of people in here already. Uh, Dorothy says, "Easy, he cracks me up." Translation: Easy, please stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Be quiet, Arab. Uh, oh, by the way, Ray, I did have a thought. You in New thought? Zealand, yes, for the first time ever. In New Zealand, um, what do you call that sandwich you guys eat with fish in it? A what sandwich? Food. No, no, no. The, the sandwich with fish in it. It's, it's popular. You mix it with mayonnaise and... What? Oh, you mean marmite? No. That you, for omelets? Fish sandwich. Does it go in the omelets? No. This is going to be... He's leading up to Not sardine, but a what sandwich? Anchovy? <laughs> What? Anchovy? So, when you, or, you order a sandwich, of course. The first See, those that are listening mayonnaise? didn't realize this is going to be this deep. Tuna. Yeah. What do you, what? what do you call it? You're just trying to make fun of an accent. <laughs> oh, what are you, how do you just, say it? Yeah, tuna. Yeah, yeah. Tuna? Yeah, so I, you, I, no, I'd say tuna over here. I, I, but I, you I, say tuna in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. like it's So, tuna. would you say YouTube? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. <laughs> YouTube. Now, we've Chew. got a lot of Australians, New Zealand, things, people that do say YouTube and they're listening and they're mocking you right at the moment. YouTube. Oh, do we have, we have any Australians in here? Let's Nobody see. from New Zealand would be watching us no. right now. <laughs> white bait. White bait. Who yeah. said white bait? Oh, wait. Is that a oh, white bait? There, there's someone from New Zealand. Yeah. Said white bait. So, guys, thank you for joining us. All Eddie, two which of camera you. do I look at? All that two one, of you. that one. I guess uh, that one's fine. Yeah. You switch do on. the three of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, thanks for joining us. This is our first ever. YouTube Live. What do you call it? Live. Is it really? YouTube Live. Well, We've done for things the, in the past. No, but for the podcast. Oh, yeah, 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 it doesn't yeah, count. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it doesn't count. We're doing a combination today, friends. And we're glad you're with us. We've got, let's see here, uh, Ruben and Alex, Carla E, praying for your son. Self wow, this is awesome. What up, your dog, Anthony Gutierrez? And That's got, for you, Easy. We got <laughs> Kurt <laughs> from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Someone here from New Zealand, Oscar, where Vietnam. Are you the place Malone, like New York. York. They're, up, they're saying it. Oh, they're telling us. Yeah, yeah. Germany? Tell us where you're from, guys. And uh, they are. They're if you have a look, there's Germany. Oh, there's uh, Germany. Up. Yep, that's wonderful. We that's were in great. Germany. Jill Fortner. Someone from Awesome. Yachuna. Someone's <laughs> like <laughs> <Kurt's laughs> from Yachuna. <Awesome. Yachuna. laughs> <laughs> so anyway, watching watch you from New Zealand. Oh, how yeah, cool is this? Anthony Guterres, Tracy Browning, Mighty Minia. Someone here says you turn into a rat. You should rat their names. Yeah, I see Eddie, he's extremely steady, sharper than the sharpest machete, cutting everything up into confetti. Ooh, you like that? <laughs> no. I've been, no. That I've been busting that on Eddie for years. Ask where they're from. Yeah, yeah, it's, where are you from? Yeah, let us North know where Carolina. you guys are from. There they come. Look, we've got to acknowledge this is Wait, Wales. Wait, Orange this County, Orange California. County. Back, Back to the Orange County over there. It's good. This Cinematic is going too summer. fast. Wait a minute. Look, Never <laughs> watch. Hey, hang on, look. This is India. Great Britain, New Zealand, Sweden, Baltimore. So people just log in to watch us Baltimore. talk about where they're from. That's how That's this goes. Ohio, okay. Kansas, <laughs> Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut, <laughs> Delaware, Florida. <laughs> Daniel Walker from oh, Washington State. Me. This is awesome, you guys. We're so glad you've joined us. Uh, I don't know if you've been following the podcast or not, but 
We've been having a blast. I mean, this is awesome. Some of us have been having a blast. Wow. Mark's been napping. Those of us that are skilled at it have been having a blast. But those of you who don't know, uh, we started a podcast. It's been about three or four weeks now. We release two episodes a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. They run about 30 to 45 minutes long each. I think we have Uh, 12. Is it 12 up now? 11 or 12, yeah. We're definitely in double digits. Four idiots speaking, and every now and then we touch on a little substance. (laughs) Yeah, randomly. So yeah, every Tuesday and Thursday, if you guys haven't already, it would it would bless and help us if you would go to whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts, for example, uh, Apple Podcast, and subscribe to the Living Waters Podcast, and then leave a comment and a review. The reason why we're asking everyone to do that is because there is no shortage of podcasts about spirituality out there. Uh, but there's not many of them that are biblical, sound, and uh, uh, edify people for evangelism, and this is one of them. And so the more that you rate it and review it, the more that you subscribe, the more others will find it and uh, hear the gospel. Could you run you through were, that again? I wasn't we were I totally fell asleep. You were actually time. able to keep your train of thought. Now I understand easy. what it's like being you. <laughs> Dude, yeah, we're, we're not exactly. sponsored by any water company, <laughs> yeah. so. That's smart. Yeah. yeah. You said to hide way. our water bottles. Yeah, whatever. All right, guys. Uh, now, oh, did you give them the email address? <laughs> Podcast at livingwaters.com. Uh, that's where you can send in your questions, your comments, and we want you to connect with us there. Also, topic ideas for future podcasts. And so I know some of you saw this promoted as a YouTube Live, but we want you to connect with the podcast so that when new ones come out, you can, uh, you can connect with You them. can also send mail to Easy's home address, which is? Yeah, <laughs> I will give him your address right now. You know, a question came in for Ray right off the beginning from Udler. Ray, do you feel old? You look it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what someone said? Yeah. Oh, it's a troll. Uh, um, someone else said, Hail Satan. Oh, we got Northern Did Ireland. See, see that easy? Thomas Norton. No. We've got a troll it. saying, Hail Satan. Yes. Satan can't make hail. It's God that gives the rain. <laughs> and the, it's ridiculous. He's the weather, man. Yeah. Uh, Lexi, thank you so much for subscribing and listening to the podcast. We really appreciate that. Yeah, look, in fact, if you haven't subscribed yet and you do subscribe, when you subscribe, just tell us in the comments. I'll give you a shout out if I see your name. And just uh, to let you guys know Cape how... Cape Town, South Africa, Dang. Nicholas Jackson. That might be the Very furthest cool. one. Just let, give you guys an insight on what's going to happen today. Right now, we're having a little bit of fun uh, chatting with you guys. Mm-hmm. In a few minutes, we're actually going to record one of our podcasts that will end up on, uh, on the podcasting apps. And so you guys will be able to see, see what that's like and how that happens. And then coming out of that... We're going to spend some time in a Q&A where we're going to ask you guys questions or ask you to ask us questions and we'll do our we best are to help them Mark to ask us questions. Answer them. Which is kind of yeah, April yeah, Deeds, you thank you. Me. I yeah. read that. Thank you April. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell them what you said, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, so guys, get your questions ready because like Oscar said we're going to open up for Q&A uh, and remember podcast at livingwaters.com. We're seeing the comments fly by, but if you want to give us topic ideas or you have questions or even feedback and input about the podcast, it helps us a lot. Uh, it encourages us and it, it uh, also gives us direction. So today, uh, we're going to be doing a topic that came in from one of you. In fact, it's from Living for Jesus. Hopefully, you're, you're watching now live with us, but uh, the, the handle name is Living for Jesus. And uh, they said, hi, I would love it if you guys talked about anxiety and how to grow in your relationship with God. And so today we're going to be talking about that. And guys, let's let's kick it off. You know, this, I think what would be good is for us to talk about the whole realm of of trials as believers. You know, the times when we're feeling like our lives are falling apart, uh, whether it's anxiety uh, or it's uh, stress or it's financial problems, uh, health issues, uh, you, you name it, right? The trials of life. Um, and, and I love the way that they, they connected that with how do we, how do we walk with God? Uh, how do we grow in our relationship with God? Yeah. Because that's really, that, that's kind of the heart of the issue. <clears throat> We're living in a world that's, that's full of unfavorable circumstances, difficulties, struggles, trials. How do we, in the midst of that, uh, grow in the Lord and maintain our composure. It's not about Easy. surviving. Easy, get it. No, we Mark. Get it. Listen to me, Mark. <laughs> How, you're going to rephrase that question like a hundred different times in a hundred different ways. I understand the question. Yeah, but Wait, he, what needs, was the question he, he needs to keep he, saying it because he, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. <laughs> 
They answered a prayer. You know what? Really? This will go, yeah, so this will go wrap the question. Up. Join the three of us. <laughs> That'll all. go viral now. You know how they walk off some of those talk shows? Oh, you yeah. walked off. No, it's good these you have to unplug I'm not yourself. listening. I'm reading all these wonderful quotes yeah. from people. Okay, so Ray's listen. Gone. Uh, I, no, I, no, Mark, Your stop. flashlight is on your phone, I think. <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> I have no How are you idea. the president of this company and you leave your phone? Behold your phone. the Lord's anointed. No, but Mark, let me finish before you really interrupted me. Maintaining composure, because it's not just about surviving, it's about thriving. <laughs> was that it? <laughs> Is that what you were hitting? That's, That's all you wanted to say. That's all you wanted to say. So come on, guys. Let's let, let's talk about that. Uh, trials, difficulties, struggles. Can can I work for the backwards forwards? Yeah, I right. Do. Let me start off with just Romans 8, 28. Yeah. In the Turn midst around, of that. work from the backwards. The backwards, forwards. <laughs> uh, Romans 8, 28, it says that all things work together for good. Amen. So what does that mean? Right For the believer, all things are working together for good. Things are not falling apart. They're falling into place. And if they're falling into place, as I share with my kids all the time, there really is no such thing as bad news. Now, I get it. I get it that that rape is evil. Your child's wayward experiences are evil. Your spouse's infidelity is evil. I understand that. Totally get it. But as a believer with a lofty view of God's sovereignty, as we have, then we believe that things are not falling out of place. They're falling into place. And these are just stepping stones. I tell my kids all the time, this is not an issue. Whatever that issue is, it's not an issue. Yeah. COVID, it's not an issue for God. God is not pacing back and forth going, I did not see this one coming, right? He's not blinking. He has no sweat on his brow. In fact, all during COVID, I was sharing with churches all across here in Southern Cal that you're allowed to worry as much as God is worried. Hmm. But God is not worried, so therefore I'm not worried. Or as R.C. Sproul said, there's not one maverick molecule in the entire universe. Let's add, there's not one wow. uh, maverick COVID molecule in the entire universe, right? God blows things and he does things as he sees fit. So if all things are working together for good, then there really is no such thing as bad news for the believer. That every little detail, everything is working together for my good and for God's glory. That's the end. Now, I have a lot to say in between, but I'll yeah. give you guys a chance. Well, yeah, and, and to remember the, the, the connection with that is as he's conforming us into the image of yeah. Christ. So I love it, the saying that says, you know, that God uses our trials as our servants. He mm. turns our trials into our servants, and they work in us for the good, conforming us into the image of Christ, making us more like him as Ray drops his iPad. Yeah, that quote, didn't you? And... Uh, and, and <laughs> you tube and resulting in his glory it's behind me you know so uh it's important to remember that but mark this is a thing right how do we because it's not to me it's not knowledge right we know we know that every believer can tell you as christians we're supposed to live a life focused on the lord even when things are hard and aren't going the way we want them to go the problem is, is how do you remember that in the heat of the moment? How do you get it to where, right? We can talk about it. It's like when I was a kid, right? I would be uh, thinking about the fight that I was going to have the next day after school that was scheduled. And, you know, I'd be watching some, you know, the <clears throat> Kung Fu movie or something, Bruce Lee. And I remember <laughs> get I'd, ready. I'd go outside. He's like, I'm going to need some nunchucks. Oh, but I would. I mean, <laughs> Chinese stars Chinese check. Stars, I know. <laughs> I it's would, hard to believe that you are a gang member. Yo, what's up? Because you weigh 102 pounds. Yeah, 101.5. <laughs> but uh, I would go outside. I would like, Wah! I would run and do karate things. I would throw, you know, and I was, I was psyched up. But the next day when, when I was facing my opponent, it was a whole different thing. So, Ray, how do we remember? How do we, how do we in, the, in the heat of, of the moment, in the furnace of affliction, how do we remember? To I think you have to be determined. Paul spoke of being determined because it's so easy to get caught up in the lion's den. You know, I often think of Daniel in the lion's den. He could have gone up and tied their whiskers in a knot. <laughs> really, he could have gone tickle, 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 tickle their ears because their mouths were stopped. I don't think they were walking around, licking their lips and saying, man, that, that lunch that was dropped in the den today, I can't touch it because God's... And I think they're walking around sniffing him. I think God made them like kittens, mm. just totally... Passive. Just purring. Yeah, complete, just purring. And so <laughs> Daniel could have spent the night going, <laughs> oh, serious, staring at them, thinking, are they going to attack me in a minute, or can I go up and really tie the whiskers in a knot? And that's Real you're quick, say what something. did Daniel do? Daniel? 
Yeah. Well, and no, and I, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. You That's know, it. Ray, this makes sense to me. This Is this why when you and I were in Alaska and there was a moose in the parking lot, you walked up to the thing like it was a kitten? <laughs> Did that See, really was, happen? No, he's walking around like, hey, moosey, moosey, moosey. <laughs> and the people with us are like, that thing will kill you. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. No, God stop stopped the mouth of the moose. <laughs> and so um, I, I was quite happy with that. But you guys weren't. You were freaking out. You know? oh, freaking but anyway, um, yeah, so in the heat of the moment, you just got to remember that God's in total control. He's sovereign. And nothing can stop the hand of God. So being determined. Uh, but there's a problem. We'll say it. We don't do that. True. I remember when I went through uh, years of panic attacks, one thing that really annoyed me was the Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. Then it says the wicked flee when no man pursues. And for about a year, I was fleeing when no one was pursuing. So tell us about that, Ray, because I think, you know, a lot of people watch us do this. They watch the TV program. They they you know, follow the ministry and they see us in action, they don't realize that we're, we're men that go through trials and struggles like everyone else. But and very fallible. Very, <laughs> especially you three. <laughs> but, but no, I mean, Ray, it's good for people to know we've gone through hard stuff. So talk about that. Yeah, I love Toza said, uh, before God uses a man, God breaks a man. And uh, God certainly let my spirit be broken through panic attacks. I was in, uh, in the north of New Zealand. I was at a farmhouse in a back room and I was waiting to speak that night, and for no reason while I was standing there, I, like, I cannot express in any other way, it was like a thousand demons mm. just flooded my mind. I fell on the floor, I, I just cried out to God. It was like terror filled my heart that I'd never experienced before, like a living nightmare. Wow. It absolutely devastated mm. me, and it so devastated me for a year, I couldn't have lunch with my family. That was wow. too traumatic to actually sit at a table. And as I said, the thing that bothered me is I knew all the Bible verses. I'm with you, fear not, righteous as bold as a lion, and I could not appropriate them. Mm. I would lie in bed in the mornings and feel my heart thumping through my chest and break out and sweat, and there was no lion. Wow. There was nothing to fear. Mm. It, was, it was called agoraphobia, and when people get it, man, I empathize with them. My heart mm. breaks for them because I know it's devastating because it doesn't come from without, it comes from within. It's like mm. you've got no foundation. And I just had to learn to uh, trust God and all that. And in time, it got healed. And there's certain principles you can do. When a panic attack comes on, there are certain... Uh, when you understand what's happening, your, your brain is being starved of oxygen because your heart beats faster. It's a, a irrational fear. The heart goes thump, thump, thump. No lion, but you feel like there's a lion attacking you. And so that starves your brain of oxygen. So you become bewildered. Then you break out and sweat. And the thing to do is just stop for a minute and breathe deeply through your nose mm. and breathe out through your mouth a number of times, as much as you can take in through your nose. That puts oxygen back in the brain and it also gives you something to do, something physical to do, to take away your fear of that fear that's just enveloping you. So yeah. there are certain things you can do. We wrote a, I wrote yeah. a book on it called- Yeah, and, you know, Ray, I was just thinking about that. Uh, yeah, overcoming panic attacks. If, if you struggle with panic attacks or know anyone who does, that this book is, is excellent for that. And Ray, I was thinking, about that, uh, you can get that at livingwaters.com. <clears throat> but I was thinking about that, Ray, what you went through has birthed something that is helping people around the world. And that's what we forget about trials, you know, that in the midst of them, we're going through it, but that the Lord can in His grace. And, and I'm not saying this is something you should say to someone as they're in the midst of a trial. We need to show sympathy, empathy, mm. compassion. But we know that the Lord takes those and uses them and He affects other people through it. You've been able to write a book on that. And, and even people watching now I know are getting hope to think Ray Comfort went through that. You know, I can get through what I'm going through. Yeah. God's brought him through it, he can bring me through it. Also, when you've got a broken spirit, it means that you don't take the glory. You know, yeah. people come up and compliment you, it just goes off like a, I don't want to go through chastening again. And one thing, you know, I read Hebrews 12, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither faint when you're rebuked of him. I know what that fainting feeling is. And then it says, Afterwards, it brings forth a peaceable fruit of righteousness. Yeah. And I remember saying, what are the peaceable fruits of righteousness? <laughs> I want it now to get yeah. through this thing. So what I actually did is I wrote the word afterwards in, in big thick marker and put it on the wall so that I would know there was an afterwards. There was light at the tunnel. At the end of the tunnel, it's not a train heading for me. I was going to come out of this. God was working for my good. That's what sustained me. And what was horrific for me is I had to itinerate through that whole thing. And let me just say this. That's what amazed me about what you went through because you continued to do that. You were still preaching and teaching 
while going through that. And that to me is a, is a sign of perseverance because that's really what we're talking about today. It's perseverance, not just survival, but, but actually sticking it out and honoring the Lord and doing what we're called to do. So how did you do that, right? How did you keep going? Day by day, it really was like that. Just the support of a, a faithful wife. Um, Cause you, you had told me once you would, you, you would, someone came to your door, a good friend came to your door and you had to close the door in their face because yeah, you just couldn't, you'd break out in a cold sweat and you'd see someone in the airport or. Yeah, just after I'd run through airports, it was just, it was like a living nightmare. It really was, and I can see why people uh, run to the bottle. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an unbeliever, so I ran to the Lord, and it strengthened, it settled, established me, made me strong, <laughs> made me say, I never, ever want to go of God. This is oh, like man. a tiny, tiny little taste of hell. And so it's given me that determination to hold on to the Lord with all my heart, and also it's given me an empathy for the ungodly, the fears the ungodly go through. Um, let me see if I can express this. In the light of God's promises, no one should have anxiety. In the light of God's promises. Mm. But we do. And they, there are certain good points about anxiety. And here's some of the good points. As a believer in Christ, I'm not a, I'm not a slave to faith. I don't have to have faith in God. I can choose not to have faith in God any minute I want. And I deliberately do that regularly. I pull down my shield of faith and look into the chasm of unbelief just for mm. a minute that wow. dark chasm of being an unbeliever. And suddenly my breath is taken away as I, I experience the fear of death, the fear of the future, the fear of losing a loved one, the, the, the fear of all these fears, and I lift my shield up. And, and what that does is it gives me an empathy for the ungodly. I come away with a groan in my heart for unsaved people to think that's what they have. Mm -hmm. And uh, it puts passion in my preaching, puts passion in my prayers. And another thing that it helps with is when I bring that shield of faith back up and say, no, I trust God's promises. Mm. Yeah. That produces an explosion of gratitude. That's wow. good. I say, Lord, thank you for saving me from that. I don't fear the future. I don't fear death because Jesus destroyed death. I don't fear the future because you've got the future in your hand. Mm. I don't feel disease because everything that comes to me comes with a safety net of Romans 8, 28. Yeah. It comes by your permission. And so I so appreciate having trust in God's promises. Yeah. They're a lifeline to me. You know, I That's think good. of what it says in Hebrews about the children of Israel as they were wandering in the wilderness. It says that, that they, didn't, they didn't mix faith in, and so it, was, it didn't profit them. Right. And because, you know, we go through, through struggles and trials, but when you, when you add that, that faith, that determination to believe what God has said, um, yeah, the assurance <clears throat> of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, I'm assured this is my hope. Christ is the center of it. And, and I, I'm assured of it. I don't see it, but, but you know, I, I have that conviction that what God has said is true and it carries you through. I want to uh, take a step back and sort of uh, categorize different kinds of anxiety and then move forward to talk about something else. Because what you're talking about, I think, is almost like a, a, a clinical anxiety attack, uh, something that, um, is, that, that happens to a lot of people. Um, but there's also another kind of anxiety, which is the anxiety of worry or doubt, right? Like you're going into a job interview and you're having yeah. worry, things of that nature. But there's also, uh, we, we live now in an anxious age where everybody's anxiety levels are just overly heightened. Um, right. I like to call that ambient anxiety, which is just simply saying, all of us where you know, the Lord would desire us to be at a level zero, most of Americans, whether even when they're not experiencing a moment like that, even when they're not worried about going into a job interview, their level of anxiousness is just heightened. It's at a three or a four, and that's just like a regular day. That's a good day. We are living with ambient anxiety. It's like the white noise that's behind us. And I think it's important to recognize where that comes from and why that's happening. I think ultimately our entire lived experience as Americans is designed to distract us from the glory of God mm -hmm. and designed to make us feel restless and unsatisfied. Just think about this, like what is the American dream? It's the pursuit of happiness. 
Yeah. See, the American dream isn't be happy, it's to pursue happiness. It's to constantly desire and want and need to perform and grab and get. And so everybody is always living in a constant state of like, oh, if only my job, if only my career, if only the car, if only the house, if only the kids, if only I got married, if only, if only, if only. And the kicker with that is, that's a lie from the devil. Because what ha all of us knows, all of us have longed for something, our first home, a new car, we get it. A new boss. A new boss, we're waiting. <laughs> Watch it, Mark. But what happens when we get it? The next day, we find another grass to be greener. We think of something else, if only, if only, if only. We are living in an age where we're constantly striving to get something that we think is going to make us happy. And then you couple that with a digital distraction. Like the fact that we're just restless with our phones. Uh, um, what's this? Alan Noble wrote a book called Disruptive Witness. Awesome. Are we typing? Uh, Alan Noble wrote a book called Disruptive Witness, and he gives this example of like, we can't even go on a, on a hike without being unplugged. Because you go on a hike and you hit this moment where like you're staring at a waterfall or a beautiful scene of the ocean, and instead of just enjoying the glory of God, you're thinking to yourself, what filter should I use for my Instagram post? Yeah. You were constantly, even when we don't have our phones in front of us, we're constantly looking at the world through a digital perspective, which distracts us from the glory of God. Uh, we live in an anxious age. And here's how I put it. All of these things, Andy Crouch, uh, he, he says that all of these things are idols. And idols, uh, all of these things make promises to you that if, if you pursue them, that career, that job, that house, whatever the case, that they will satisfy you. But they never do, they never satisfy you. Instead, they take more and more and give less and less. And so here's the way I would explain it. It's a lot like fishing. Not like fishing for the, the things in the ocean, you know, but fishing like those phishing emails, the PH phishing emails where they're like, hey, <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you just inherited $500. And I don't know if you've ever looked at this, <laughs> but here's what happens, not that I've ever responded, yeah. but here's what happens. If you're like, oh, I want my $500, you'll be like, okay, cool. All you need to do is uh, uh, write this check for $100 and then we'll send you the 500. And if you write the check, it doesn't stop there. They'll come back to you and go, actually, we just discovered that it's not $500, it's 50,000, but there's more paperwork to do. And so now we need you to write another check for $1,000. Now you might think that that doesn't work, but then I read an article oh, about works. a lady in Japan, yeah. a billionaire, that got fish out of $29 million. Wow. $29 million, that's insane, right? Here's the point that I'm making though. All of these false idols in our lives, all of these promises of job, career, situational changes, they are fishing us. They are telling us, hey, look, if you just accomplish this, do that, gain this, work here, do these things, then you will be satisfied. But they are taking more and more and more and giving us less and less and less. And so in order for us to put to rest that ambient anxiety, I do believe that we need to rest in the Lord. Psalm 23, he needs to be our one comforter. It's like the Heidelberg Catechism. My one comfort in life and death is that I am not my own, but I belong to God. Amen. I think the more we understand and believe that, the more we can put the rest, that ambient anxiety, and move forward in our lives joyfully for the glory of God. Yeah, and you know, uh, you mentioned the, the grass looking greener on the other side. I've shared this before on the podcast, but. I know there's a lot of new people with us, but that whole, that picture that I, I saw before that showed two cows, each with equal amount of grass, the grass looked the same, both of their heads were going through the barbed wires, eating the grass on the other person's side, and in the, in the meanwhile, they got entangled in the barbed wire, and the picture just said discontentment. Mm -hmm. You know, what a perfect picture. You think the grass looks good, but, you know, as the saying goes, and we've said this before, it, the, the water bill's probably a whole lot higher on the other side. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it, it, it just, once you, come out of the realm of contentment, you lose sight of God, the glory of Christ, who He is, and resting in Him, then it leads to all kinds of intricate complications and, and problems. Mark, I know you've got a lot uh, on this subject, so I, I wanna hear from you on this. Well, Oscar nailed it. 
that, uh, I mean, where are we going to go? He alone holds the words to eternal life. We can't go back to Egypt for anything. That if we are going to run, and it's okay to run, we run towards Christ. It's a lot like when we became a Christian, to escape God's wrath, we run towards God's grace, right? We, we need to run towards God. In uh, Mark's gospel, I think it's right around chapter 4 or chapter 5, we have Jesus asleep inside the boat. The, the storm is tumultuous. Things are crashing all around. Things are crazy. And then here's Peter. He looks over at Jesus and he says, don't you care that we're perishing? Yeah. So the beginning of the ministry, here's Peter saying, God, don't you care? In other words, he didn't have a, a good glimpse. He didn't have enough knowledge on who Jesus Christ was. It's been said, if you want knowledge, go to school. If you want wisdom, get on your knees. Mm. Well, here's Peter looking at Jesus, accusing him, if you would, as if he didn't care. And then at the end of Peter's earthly ministry in Peter, he learned to say through the miraculous signs that Jesus performed, through all of the words that Jesus said, just hanging out with Jesus, he was able to say, cast all your cares mm. on him, mm. for he cares for us. Wow. He went from a place of unbelief and disbelief, don't you care, to guys, it doesn't matter what it is. I can throw anything on him because he cares. He knows what I'm going through. And I think that's where we need to rest. We need to continually rest on the fact that we are but dust. He's not. He made me. And I remind God of that all the time. And it's a reminder for me. Lord, remember that I'm but dust. Have mercy on me. You tell us that you delight in being merciful. Mercy is giving somebody, is holding back something that somebody does deserve. Grace has given them what they deserve. And justice has given somebody exactly what they deserve. Well, listen, I want what I don't deserve. And I want you to hold back that which I do deserve. I want you to be God. I will follow. I'll go anywhere as long as it's forward. I'll go anywhere as long as he says, this is from him. Yeah. Right? So... The things that people worry about, I, I'll, I'll finish it with this stat, and I do have a lot, but um, these, are the, these are the facts about worry. 40% of the things people worry about never happen. 30% hmm. of our worries are related to past matters which are now beyond our control. 12% of our worries have to do with our health even when we are not actually sick. 10% of our worries are about friends and neighbors and are not based in evidence of fact. Therefore, only 8% of our worries have some basis in reality, which means that over 90% of the things that we worry about never happen. Mm, wow. Yep. So we, we can, my, my sister, my, uh, my sister is my sister, it's my daughter, in the sense that she's a Christian, right? Uh, my daughter wrote a, uh, a letter to a friend of ours who has been recently diagnosed with cancer. And inside the letter was just a, a quick, simple one-liner that simply said, you don't need to worry about tomorrow because he's already there. Mm, I love that. So today, we can focus in on what we have. Like right here, we're not even promised after this table any other assignment. Yeah. Thomas Watson said, the only thing that is promised to you is the breath inside your mouth, but there's no guarantee of an exhale. Mm. So we, we need to be careful because every time we do take a breath, we're sucking in the mercy of God. Amen. It's true. Ray, and, oh, good. Yeah. Ray, I was going to say, don't you think that it's a great opportunity for testimony to the world of the greatness of our God as Christians when we have that distinct peace in the midst of the storms of life. I mean, it goes beyond just, because we're talking about how do you sustain yourself, but, but it, there's more than that. It's how we impact the world through how we live. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've got something on my mind I'd like to share and perhaps get back to that, whatever the question was. <laughs> <laughs> This is all that Ray just heard. Wah, 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 well, it's wah, exactly wah, it. wah, like wah, Charlie wah, Brown. Charlie Brown. Yeah, right. And then he said, yes. I, so, I, I have, a, I have I a weekly I anxiety that drives me crazy, and I can't really avoid it. And it's getting on the 605 on the way to hunting the beach. <laughs> There's a certain on-ramp, and it's different from every other on-ramp. You've got a freeway that goes around. I think it's the 91 around here. I've got to get on 30 miles an hour my little Beetle. Okay? It's just it's 10 years old. And there's SUVs, about 100 of them, black, coming there at 75 miles an hour. <laughs> I've, got to get, get a, I've got to get across four lanes within about 30 seconds. 
They've got to get across four lanes in 30 seconds to go around the 91. And so as I get on, the speed differential in my mind is massive. My 30 miles an hour to 75, that's what it looks like to me. And I'm screaming, let me on, let me live, please, please. And I'm moving over and they're saying, you silly little idiot, don't you know how to get on a freeway? Speed up, speed up. And if anything, if anything's appropriate for the golden rule, it's that. Mm. Treat others as you'd like to be treated. Wow. And if they would just think, put themselves in my position, I put myself in their position, then we can all work. And that's how the whole, that would make the whole world work and be anxiety free. But I, I always get anxiety, so I'm going up that ramp. I say, here goes, am I going to live? Am I going to live? And then 30 <laughs> seconds later, hey, I do. Your usually. solution is easy. Why don't you drive your Lamborghini on those days? Oh, because I like to polish it. <laughs> I like, I don't I like, like to it polish it. it. <laughs> yes. And you're always <laughs> borrowing the helicopter. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now that's going to be a rumor. I yeah. know. Uh, Mark, I really love what you said because there is, there is this reality where anxiousness is oft, often us being caught up in a potential future and trying to control or manage or wrap our hands around that. Whether we're like, how is this gonna happen? What's this conversation gonna look like? What would I do in this situation? We're anxious and worried about something that may never happen. And often, I don't know about you guys, but if you're like anxious over a conversation and then you go and have it, the conversation goes so much differently than you expected. You made much ado about this tiny little thing. I can't help but wonder if often our uh, theology or doxico doxology doesn't become uh, practical in our lives. So as an example. You better doxologize us. We're not sure what you're talking about. <laughs> so for example, you walk up to any Christian and you talk about God being omniscient okay. um, and omnipotent and all-powerful and all-knowing and sovereign. They're gonna say, yes, amen, that's the God I worship. But then you talk about their anxious moment and their future thoughts about how tomorrow's gonna to go. And all of a sudden, God being in control and trusting in God's plan goes away. And all of a sudden it's like, how can I manage my future? How can I plan and protect? And we, we suddenly drop off all of the things that we say we believe about God. And so I think one of the potential solutions for us is not just to know our Bibles, but to meditate on His Word. Because when we meditate on it, it's like it moves from the head to the heart, right? I hide my, your word, not in my head, but in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's when it goes from the head to the heart where we really start to believe it to be true and it starts to change or conform the way we live our lives. Yeah. And so meditating on the reality yeah. of God's greatness is really important. Yeah, it's huge. And, uh, you know, I've often said, well, I like the saying that says uh, anxiety is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but doesn't get you anywhere. That's good. That's <laughs> you know, good. you're just in action in place. It's like running in place. But, you know, I, I've also said often that anxiety produces nothing but regret. And, and here's why. Um, if, you're, if you're on your way to engage in something or you have something big that, that, that you're going to do and it works out, then you look back and you say, why did I waste all that right. time being right. anxious, man? And then if it doesn't work out, you look back and say, oh man, instead of being anxious, I could have focused more or put more into it that it could have gone better. So anxiety produces nothing but regret. And I think oftentimes the reason why we're anxious is because of what we're focused on. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, we're going to reflect the object that we're focused on. And I love Isaiah 26.3, which says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you mm. because... He trusts in you. Oh, that's good. And so if you think about it, right? You're on your way to a job interview. You're headed to school to take a big exam. Uh, you're going to have an important meeting with someone. I have a job oh. interview later today, actually. Oh, so thank you. good. <laughs> there will be no need for that. Uh, but, but you know what I'm saying? So you're, you're headed and, um, and, and you're focused on that. So I'm driving. I'm going to work. I'm going to school. I'm going to the meeting. How's it going to go today? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? The object I'm focused on is uncertain. It might be the best interview, the, the best... Uh, you know, test, whatever, the best meeting. But on the other hand, it might not be, might be the worst. So if I'm focused on that, I'm going to be like the mercury in the thermometer going up and down with the change of whatever thought is going in my head, like temperature, you know, it's good to be up and down. But if my mind has stayed on the Lord, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he never changes. His faithfulness is true. His love for me is true. My eternity is sealed. I'm going to be with him. He's going to cause all things to work together for good. 
then I'm going to reflect that stable, unchanging object, which is the Lord, and I'm going to be kept in perfect peace. Why? Mm -hmm. Because my mind is stayed in him, on him, and I trust in him. That's good. So I think the, the greatest non-scriptural quote I've ever heard is uh, by a man named John Sale. I don't know too much about his theology, but this quote is something that I've held on to for a good portion of my adult Christian uh, walk. He said, if I had the power of God, there are many things I would change. But if I had the wisdom of God, I would not change a thing. Mm. And you think about all of our situations mm. and circumstances where we go, man, if I could only change this, if I could manipulate that, if this could happen, if I could get this inheritance. Listen, you don't want anything like that. Remember, if you want knowledge, go to school, wisdom, get on your knees. And what we really need is just a bigger vision of who God is. I must decrease, he must increase. <clears throat> Lord, wh whatever you want to do. And it's a verse that I just gave to my son uh, yesterday, Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your steps. Do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Now listen to what it says in the Amplified Version. What you're going to read a little loud. I'm going to read it a little bit louder because it's the Amplified Version. <laughs> trust in and rely confidently on the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all your ways, know and acknowledge and recognize him, and he will make your path straight and smooth, removing obstacles that block your way. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord with reverent awe and obedience and turn entirely away from evil. Hmm. We may not know entirely what is going on in our lives, but we can know entirely him who knows what is going on inside of our lives. And that's not to say we will know everything about God, but we know enough about God to know that he knows what's going on in my life. So it's enough to say, God knows. Amen. God knows what I'm going through. Mm. So therefore it is well with my soul. I won't worry and freak out and pace back and forth. I'm going to trust him. And then Psalm 55, 22, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Amen. Yeah, and you know, um, anxiety, I think, is oftentimes the byproduct, too, of dwelling in places that don't exist. We keep talking about we don't know if we have tomorrow. Well, we also don't have yesterday. And right. a lot of times we, we, we're, we're so fearing the future and so regretting the past that right. we're paralyzed in the present. That's good. And it really, it, it just keeps us from being fruitful. And so we, we need to remember that all we have is now, and in the now, all I have is the next five minutes, if yeah. that. All I have is what's before me. And so I can handle that. You know, I think sometimes we're looking, oh man, look how much I blew it. I'm gonna blow it again, or I failed here, I failed. And it just, it paralyzes us. And we don't realize that there's really no such thing as sus being suspended in, in, in one place as Christians, right? We're, our history is always being written. And a lot of times we carry with us, if you can imagine in life, this invisible book. I call it the invisible book. And there are different sections in it, right? The first section is like our, the recording of our, our conception, our birth, our first step taken, our first word uttered. And then the next section, it's every other word uttered, every other word ever spoken until we get to the next place where the pen is writing and that's the present. And as we live, it writes. And then there's the last section of the book, which is the last page. That's reserved for the recording of our final step taken, our final word uttered. It's there, the final period will be penned, the fine pen laid to rest, and the filled and finished book brought to its unforgettable close. That's the end of our lives. Was but that we, one of your poems? Well, it's a little kind of a thingy, majingy, flakingy. A majingy. Like that, flakingy, majingy. No, I like what you said. But, but, um, but no, so, um, you made me lose one my day pen. Ray's eyes are going to get well. stuck behind him, <laughs> roll, being rolled at you. Yeah, we're easy. talking about the pen. Yeah, pen yeah. Finally put to rest. But here's, here's what we do. So, what we often do as believers, I think, is we open the past chapters of our lives and we read and reread them, read and reread them. And for many of us, the, last, the past chapters of our lives are full of sin and failure and, and so forth and all kinds of things. But what we don't realize is that while we're doing that, while we're focusing our minds on that, we're going to produce more of the same. I mean, you know, when, when, a lot of times when they, they, they catch rapists or murderers or a lot of times they were meditating on pornography or on, on crazy metal music that's full of, of you know, different things about killing people or whatever. So if we're focusing on sin and failure, we're going to produce the same. And a lot of times when we do that, we think we, we give up. We're just kind of, I'm not fighting anymore. I'm not pressing on anymore. 
but either you're moving proactively in your walk with the Lord or, or you're not. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just this kind of passive survival. Okay, I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to go out and commit big sins, but I'm just, we're not moving forward and growing in the Lord. While we're doing that, the pens are still writing. So when we think things have been suspended, no, life is still going on. And when you're focusing on sin and failure and you're not moving proactively for the Lord, you're producing more sin and failure. And so what we need to do is seal up. We need to take the blood of Christ, open every page from the past, extract the lessons learned, put them in the appendix of the book called Lessons Learned, then dab the blood of Christ over every past page, seal it up until there's this thick block you can't pry into anymore. Look at what's in front of you, the new fresh page. Realize there's a lot more pages beyond that to write on and say, look, I can't change what's been written, but from this moment on, I can change what will be written by the grace of God. That was beautiful. Really and if we do that every day or every hour, okay, mm -hmm. I can't change it. Lord, forgive me of what I sent in, in there. Here's what I learned. I won't open that again, but I'll go back into the appendix. What did I learn from that? And I'm just going to start fresh. I mean, Paul said that in Philippians, right? Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to the things which lie ahead. I press on. We need to do that. That'll give us the peace of God and the focus and strength to keep moving on. Um, Sorry. I'm just wondering why it took you 45 minutes to share something of substance. Let's <laughs> count <laughs> <laughs> how many times he walks off. Yeah. You know, uh, we've been talking a lot about being anxious of something that doesn't come. Um, but there's also those situations, and I'm thinking about one who's a dear personal friend of mine now who's uh, got cancer. It's terminal, and he has a, a limited amount of time. And... Um, it is incredibly powerful to see the way in which he, him and his family, him and his wife are leaning on the Lord in this season. I mean, this is a man who's, who, you know, his youngest was born uh, weeks after he, he got a timestamp for his life, essentially. Uh, three young kids, and for them, um, for them, they're not living, they're not, if they think about their future, they know that he's that he's gonna pass away, or the potential for passing away very, very soon, right? And yet they live hopeful for the glory of God. And I think one of the things that empowers him is knowing that ultimately God went to the cross to, uh, to satisfy the demands of sin, the wrath of God, and to make right all that man has made wrong. He's focused on the promises and the love that God has for them. And it reminds me of Revelation. Because Revelation, especially the, the, the letters to the seven churches, is written in a way that like there's this husband writing home to his bride. It reminds me of a, another friend of mine, mentor, uh, Bill, who went to, he, he was in the Vietnam War, and while he was over there, his wife was going through a ton of stuff. I mean, loved ones were dying. She was raising kids alone. She's anxious and scared her husband's not coming back. And he would write to her constantly, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. We will be with each other soon. And she hung on mm. to those letters. And he did. He came home. And they both died in their late 90s just wow. happily in love. And that's the sense that we get from Revelation that God is writing. Jesus is writing a letter to his bride, the church, saying, I'm coming home. I'm coming back for you. Yeah. I'm going to make all wrong things right. And so even in those moments of anxiousness, when we know that, that what the ultimate outcome is going to be bad, we have the promises of our Savior telling us that He's coming back. Yeah, that's good. Ray, you were going to say something. Yeah, um, there are subtle causes of anxiety that we don't even realize. We're living in, the Bible says, know this, in the last days, there'll be perilous times. And then it lists all the things that cause the perils and cause anxiety and stress. A number of years ago, or two years ago, when I went through a health crisis, I found myself in a doctor's waiting room, and I looked across and saw an elderly man with the same problem that I had. He was much older than I was, and he was in obvious pain. I went up to the, I said, to the ladies at the counter. I says, uh, that man's in terrible pain. Can you do something for him? I said, we'll deal with him in a minute. And it was just made me feel horrible. Then I went straight out the back to get my blood pressure taken, and I've always got good blood pressure, always. Yeah. She looked at it, she says, this is through the roof. Mm. My blood pressure was through the roof, and it was brought on by the anxiety that I felt for that man. And I felt no different than I did normally, and anxiety can be brought on without us realizing it. Yeah. And so be careful, I say that to say, be careful of what you watch on television, because if it bleeds, it leads. I haven't hardly watched anywhere near as much news as I used to watch a couple of years mm. ago. I used to just 
take it all in. Yeah. And in, in the last couple of years, I've just almost stopped because it's always negative. And it's, it's often genuine. There's horrible things happening all over the world. They can affect you subtly. And so you feed on the word, feed on Psalms, yeah. um, feed on that which is positive and good and that which is pure and right. You bring up a really good point. As I was mentioning earlier, we are so plugged into a digital age that we see the world through the way other people want us to see it. So like we, we live in California and there's a California mass exodus because <laughs> as we all know, California is becoming more and more liberal and many conservatives are leaving. But as I was talking to some of my conservative friends who are leaving and I, I respect their decision to leave, I see the reason why they're leaving. But they were often so caught up in what they were watching in the news that for me, I, for me, I don't watch the news very often. And so when I don't feel like I live in a liberal place because I spend my time in God's word. I spend my, my time outside. You know, if you just turn off the TV and go outside, enjoy God's creation, enjoy your neighborhood, then you'll stop seeing the world through the lens of what the culture wants you to see and you'll start seeing the world for what God has, has given you, all of the gifts of his creation, of your neighbors, of believers, of playing in the, at yeah. the park with your kids. Like all of a sudden, all of those worries and concerns go away and I'm just enjoying the park on a 75 degree day in California. And what's, yeah. what's more, if you want to see tomorrow's news today, just read your Bible. There you go. <laughs> and putting things into perspective with scripture, exactly with what you just did there. Psalm 27, one, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Or Psalm 118, 6 through 7. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. Or Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. Or Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. That's good. Or finally, Psalm 56, 3. When I'm afraid... I put my trust in you. Mm. If you're gonna put your trust in something, which it seems like we all do, why don't you put it, your trust in him who is a rock? Yeah, amen. And, and again, focusing our minds on truth, right? We've, we've repeated this before. I, someone has said this, I read my Bible every morning because I'm going to be lied to throughout the oh, day. That's good. Yeah. It's I, like re, I call it recalibration. You know, we have to constantly recalibrate when something gets off kilter. I mean, they have, they have these standard weights to put on a scale to, to see if the scale is, is still right. And so we easily start losing, losing accuracy in our thinking and we need to be recalibrated. God's word is that standard weight that recalibrates us, you know? And so knowledge and an understanding of, again, what our trials are doing for us. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outer man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. I mean, this is, this is a, a promise from God's word, a truth, whatever's happening externally, inwardly, day by day, God is at work. We're remodeling our entire facility, and uh, our pastor just came the other day. At the he, ministry. And he made fun of Living Waters here. Oh, that impressive. was beautiful. But he walked in, and he goes, boy, and he's an Irishman. You can't judge a book by its cover, you know, because the, the whole place is beautifully renovated inside, but the outside isn't done yet. That's the next project. But that's what we do sometimes. We look at what's happening externally and we don't realize inside, behind the scenes, God is constantly at work conforming us into the image of Christ and transforming us. And on top of that, the heart of the Lord toward us. So think of Hebrews 4, 14 through 15. Seeing then we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. Not only, not only do we know the truth that God's working and transforming us, but we know the truth that even in the midst of our weakness, He sympathizes with us. Mm. He's experienced our temptations yep. and, and, and this world. And I love what was cited earlier. If uh, Remember our frame that we're but dust, mm. you know? Um, and, and, and I love what it says in Psalms, I think 130, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who can stand, but there is forgiveness with you. And you think of, of the heart of Christ. I mean, Matthew 12, 20, uh, a bruised reed he will not break. This is prophetically, and Jesus was applying it to himself. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He doesn't break the bruised reed. He doesn't quench the smoldering wick. And even 1 John 2, 1, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. An advocate is someone who comes alongside to help. 
So remember these truths, the truths that our God's heart toward us is always love, compassion, sympathy, and he's there to help us and see us through. Mm. So we're talking about the Lord and uh, perhaps some people watching that know about God but don't know him. Jesus said, you must be born again. And I can't help but think of his words where he says, whoever hears my sayings and obeys them are likened to a wise man who built his house on a rock. Amen. And the floods came, the winds blew, and it didn't fall because it was found upon a rock. Whoever hears these sayings and does not obey them are like to a foolish man who built his house on sand. And when the storms came, it fell and great was the fall. The essence of what he's saying is obedience. You obey him and you're like the man who built his house on rock. Both receive storms. So if you're not a Christian, get right with God. Acknowledge your sins. Mm -hmm. Look at the, the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Whoever looks with lust committed adultery in the heart. Scriptures say if you hate someone, you're a murderer. So on judgment day, you're going to be condemned and you'll find after death the judgment and you'll end up in hell and that grieves our heart. Mm. But we're here today to say that Christ died for our sins, took our punishment upon himself. The Bible says God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We broke God's law, Jesus paid the fine. That means God can dismiss your case, he can forgive your sins and grant you everlasting life as a free gift. So the essence of what we're all saying here today is repent and trust in him. That's more important to us than all our things that we're talking about is your salvation and where you spend eternity. So Amen. don't just listen about anxiety and try to appropriate these things without getting to square one, being born again and coming to know God. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Ray. Amen. Yeah, and, and again, the truths of the word for us uh, need to be primary, remembering. I mean, think of what Paul says in Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Why? Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. So it's, it's keeping these key things in mind. James 1, 2 through 4, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Yeah. So it's keeping those things in mind and remembering that God is working. You know, years ago, I, I went through something similar to you, Ray, in its intensity probably, but, but a little bit different. And that was the, this, what, what's been termed as the dark night of the soul. Yeah. And it was like a seven, eight month period where I felt total internal devastation. I think Tozer put it best. He said, in the place of everything that made your life zestful, you find nothing but heaps of ashes. Mm -hmm. Oswald Chambers went through it for like four years. He said the only thing that kept him out of an asylum was the support and love of, of friends and, and family. And I couldn't explain it other than, I, I remember I was working real far, I had an hour drive each way, and there were days I would cry the whole way there, the whole way back. I'd run into the bathroom, just, just bawl my eyes out. And at the same time, God was using me. I was, I was really young, I was like 21, and I was speaking in mega churches and conferences and and, and Was you know, that irrational? There was no reason for it? Yeah, it was just, it was, yeah, it was just like, it, part of it was an anxiety. I couldn't even look people in the eye. I was a new pastor at the time. I go to church and as soon as service ended, I would rush home because I just, I couldn't explain it, but I felt all my confidence was gone. All my, my strength was gone. I remember one time I preached, I was preaching uh, at a retreat. I had to preach 10 times, five days, two times each day, one in the morning, one in the evening. I would preach in the morning, I would go into my room, I'd weep and shake all day, and then I'd go out and preach in the evening. I don't know how I got through that. In fact, the first message I preached, I remember, I, I looked out the door of the chapel into the, the forest. I, I felt so distant from God, so disconnected from the Word. I determined in my mind, I said, I'm going to run out into the forest right now in the middle of my message and just scream like a madman. To this day, I don't know how, how it didn't happen because mm. I made the decision to do it. Next thing I know, the sermon was over and I got through it and I preached nine more times, you know. But I took a book with me uh, called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. It's a great book. And there's a, there's a uh, chapter in there called These Inward Trials. Mm. And he had, a, he had a poem or a hymn by John Newton, the man who wrote Amazing Grace. And the timing of it, I happened to be in that chapter and in the midst of that, I read that hymn. And it says, I asked the Lord that I might grow in love and faith and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. I hope that in some favored hour, at once he'd answer my request and by his love's constraining power, subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. 
Yea, more with his own hand he seemed intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds, and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. Will you pursue your worm to death? Mm. Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set you free and break your schemes of earthly joy that you may seek your all in me. Mm. And uh, I remember reading that and it was like a, it was like a balm, a healing balm. It was like salve applied to my wounds because I realized, Lord, you are allowing this. Why? To break me of my pride, uh, of my self-seeking, of my selfishness, and ultimately that I may seek my all in you and in nothing else. And that's what that taught me. You know, my mom passed away uh, back in 94. And that, you can, as you can imagine, was the most difficult thing in my life. But even that was nothing compared to that seven, eight month period I went through. And that pain that I went through, I would wish on, I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, but what God did in me through that, I would wish on everyone. Wow. That's you good. Know, so. Do you think of Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? Right. And so what you went through is biblical sacrifices of God or a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Yeah. And we, we think of a, a wild horse that's doing its thing uh, out in the wild and it's taken by man and its spirit is broken. So when he harnesses it, hmm. he can harness its energy and say to the left or to the right. Wow. And that's what God wants in a broken spirit. And that's what you get from your mm -hmm. experience. Oh. You know, when God says, do this, oh yes, Lord. Yeah. Because your spirit's broken and you belong to him and you've, the, his reins instruct you in the night season as the scriptures say. So true. And you realize he's all you have. And you know, Ray, you wrote a book, another book too, um, how to overcome life's endless trials. And again, you're talking in here, it says valuable lessons from the life of Joseph. And that's, that, what an example, Joseph, right? I mean, he's sold into slavery. Uh, he's, he's thrown in a pit by his brothers and then sold into slavery. And then he, he, he goes through all these crazy things, but he persevered and he honored the Lord. So the cover just makes me smile when I look at it. It's got a picture of Joseph's cloak, <laughs> I don't know if beautiful to cloak of many colors, being run over by an 18 wheeler. <laughs> and that's what life is like. It's just endless trials again and again. Yeah. And so- And you remember what Joseph said to his brothers? You meant it for evil. Yeah. God meant it meant for good. It's good. Yeah. And that's the whole you know, paradox of how does God's sovereignty, you know, work in all this. And things. while we're on pushing products, we've got a brand new book. <laughs> we've done it so far, might as well. This is called uh, The Ultimate Health Foods, Nine Foods That Jesus Ate or Recommended. And is I have, tacos one of them? Uh, no. Not interested. I, I have, uh, I have <laughs> I've written a lot of books, but this was probably the most exciting book because I thought there was not nine foods that Jesus ate or recommended. In fact, I've asked godly men, even your pastor, and others, very godly men, tell me nine foods that Jesus ate or recommended. Best they can get is five, maybe six. I found nine, much to wow. my excitement. And uh, it's real thrilling, and I um, decided I'd make a recipe of those nine foods and then remember that we have a friend in New York who's an award-winning chef. Chef Lance. Yeah, yeah, so I said, would you take this messy little recipe of these nine foods and make it into something professional? And he did it, and it's in the book. And then I thought, you know, we should fly him over from New York to California to film him preparing these meals. So that's what we're doing next month. Oh, and I'm very excited to do a program for our Way of the Master. But that's uh, available if, on the site. What if you took those nine things, mixed them all together, and then by some miracle, it's baklava? Ah, <laughs> keep dreaming. My yeah. ultimate. Yeah. Um, yeah, so check those out. Again, overcoming panic attacks, uh, how to overcome life's endless trials, and then the, the food book. Uh, the, the food book. Health foods. Livingwaters.com, livingwaters.com. Now, friends, remember, this is a podcast. That, that what we're doing is we're bringing you in live to what we do in here uh, every week, and which we upload two of them every week, every Tuesday and Thursday, at least right now. Uh, so make sure to, to subscribe to the podcast. Any platform, you just look up The Living Waters Podcast. Very simple. And then subscribe. And then we've got about 10 shows up already. Watch them. Rate them if, if, you, if, you, know, if you think they're worthy. And leave a comment. And then share with others. Even now, we're still live. We're still going for probably another hour. Uh, we're going to do Q&A right now. But share those. So start sending in your questions right now. Uh, we're going to start uh, looking at those and doing Q&A. You Make actually sure need to record a wrap-up for the podcast. 
a wrap up? Yeah, because the podcast has to end with you oh, saying goodbye. I think we're going to play the whole thing for the podcast, okay. Oscar. Yeah, we're going to cool. do the whole thing. So if people do want to send in a question, all right, yeah. if you have a question inside the live chat, make sure you do the at symbol and then type in Living Waters. Your question's going to stand out. If you just put in a question, it's going to get lost. So make sure you address it to us. Yeah. At Living and Waters. if you haven't already, uh, again, I think Easy mentioned it, I mentioned it. it please go online to either Apple's podcast or Spotify and subscribe to the Living Waters podcast and leave us a review, uh, a five-star review preferably. What that does is it helps us uh, get up on the SEO searches so that more and more people can find that podcast and hear the gospel. Yeah, and also remember, podcast.livingwaters.com, that's where you can uh, send us emails with ideas for future shows, share your uh, feedback and input about the podcast. Okay, um, so, do questions? so bring your questions in. I'm gonna read a final quote as, as questions roll in. You guys can look at some and we can just jump in. But this ties in everything. My wife actually sent this to our, our family uh, group text this morning and I thought, man, I, I gotta share this. It's by David Paulson. He said, the Christian life is a great paradox. Those who die to self find self. Those who die to their cravings will receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. They will find new passions worth living for and dying for. If I crave happiness, I will receive misery. If I crave to be loved, I will receive rejection. If I crave significance, I will receive futility. If I crave control, I will receive chaos. If I crave reputation, I will receive humiliation. But if I long for God and his wisdom and mercy, I will receive God and wisdom and mercy. Along the way, sooner or later, I will also receive happiness, love, meaning, order, and glory. Oh, that good? You know, seek after God. You'll receive Him and His wisdom and His mercy. And like you always talk about, Ray, the fruits of salvation will, will come accompanying. Right. But when you are focused on those other things, I want happiness, I want contentment, I want, you're going to be disappointed. Focus on the Lord. You'll receive Him. You'll be content. And then he'll give you what I call the dessert, which I mentioned before. In a Seek podcast. first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. That's good. All right. Any questions? You guys find any? Uh, yeah, here's one. <clears throat> From In the Purple Void, yeah. advice for someone looking for a church community to join. Mm. How important that is that and what are ways in which we can find a church community? Yeah. I think first and foremost you need to make sure that it's a, well, what's called a, a Christocentric church. And I remember years ago, I was getting to know this gentleman. <laughs> he may even be watching now, I don't know. I know a lot of folks at his church follow our ministry too. But we went out to dinner and uh, you know, I had just met him through my brother and he was talking about, hey, I wanna start a church. And so we go out to dinner and, 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 I, and so he goes, yeah, I wanna share with you the, the foundations of our church. And he says, it's gonna be, it's gonna be uh, friendship and oh, finance yeah. and fitness and <laughs> fellowship. And um, I was waiting for fajitas right at the end. <laughs> what? And, uh, and I, I look at my wife and I'm like, uh-oh. And I'm thinking, you know, Houston, we got a problem here. And I go, well, you know, my friend, I think you know, your church needs to be focused on Christ, centered in Christ and his word. And anyway, I remember I started giving him all these books by God Allers and I gave him Hell's Best Kept Secret. The CD and he listened to it and he ended up getting saved. He, he, wasn't, he didn't realize he didn't even know the Lord. Wow. But a, a, a church that is focused and centered uh, on Christ and, and on his word. I'm sure you guys have more to throw in. Yeah, I would say, I, I love the question. I think it's incredibly important. And unfortunately, many, um, I think, undervalue the importance and the calling of being a part of a local church. Mm -hmm. No podcast, no YouTube channel, no incredible preacher that you listen to online can replace what God intends to do uh, to you and through you in the context of a local church. And so finding a Christ-centered, biblically sound church is of the utmost important. There are certain websites, like the Nine Marks websites that you can go to in which you can help uh, maybe find one. Um, but I think even in looking for one, we talked about this in an earlier podcast, uh, even looking for one, it's important for you to know the difference between a church that is sound and biblical and know the difference between when you become a consumer. 
So if the reason why you don't like going to a particular church is because you think the chair's uncomfortable, or you're not a big fan of the way they do the music, or the preacher isn't as incredible as a preacher as Ray Comfort, those are not good enough reasons to not go to a church. If it is a biblically sound church, God desires to have you disciple through that. And there is, he has uniquely created it in such a way where there is no other substitute to be able to know God and be known, to be confronted about your sin and repent, to grow in humility and grace than through a local church. So I, right. I think it's of the utmost importance. I would go as far. If, if there's a scenario where you live in a rural area and there's just no church for miles, my personal conviction is that I would either pray to see if the Lord has fit me to plant a church or move my family because yeah. the local church is that important to me. And I know that's not for everybody, but that's how important we need it to, yeah. to focus on the local church. Yeah, and I think asking for the doctrinal statement, looking at it carefully, going out to lunch with the pastor, yeah, asking questions and probing, you know, where there's a church at. Do they practice uh, all the, you know, the, the biblical uh, mandates and callings that we've been giving? Uh, you know, do they participate in communion? Do they baptize people? Are they disciple makers? Are they concerned about the loss and are evangelizing? Uh, you know, is there a loving spirit in the church? Is there a humility in the leadership? There's so many things like that that are Amen. important. All we right. Have, you have one? Yeah, I have one. Oh, Mark, you have one? I have one. Okay. Uh, Dorothy said, uh, dark night of the soul, a widow, I feel I am in it. Mm. Uh, it is a cloak of sorrow that refuses to leave. I'm in the word and church witnessing when possible. Could you share a scripture to turn to? Well, there's plenty of scriptures to turn to, but um, let me share how I handle grief. I think we're going to do a program on grief are, sometime soon. in the future. Um, my dad died, my mum died. Um, both those instances, I bawled my eyes out and then I stood up and forgot it. Not my parents, but I forgot the whole grief thing. I'm not going down grief street again. And it's so easy to be pulled down, it's a dead end. So when I get thoughts about my dad or my mum that are very, very sad and very, very heavy upon me, I just say, I will not go down there. It's like David when he lost his child. He stood up, washed his face, he says, it's all over, I can't do anything about it, let's just move on. And you've got to do that because Grief Street will suck your soul into it. And you've got to just say, I will not go there. That's how I handle it. I don't know if a woman yeah. is different than a man, I know I'm different. And the way I handle a lot of things, I just get up and move on. But um, that's the advice I would give. Yeah, I think you know, grief and lament are important uh, to, to, to be experienced at the outset of you know, a, a traumatic situation. I think God has given that to us. It brings release, it, it's cathartic, it's healing. And you know, we look at the Psalms and yeah. they're, they're full of that. But yes, pressing on and learning to look toward the Lord, uh, you know, in those and taking your, your, your griefs to God and letting Him heal you and work in you through yeah. His Spirit. I, I don't remember the young lady's name, but- Dorothy. Oh, this is Dor the one you just talking about? The one that you just quoted. Yes, Dorothy. Dorothy, I, I'm, first off, I'm so sorry that you're going through that. Um, I've been through it. As Easy mentioned, he's had a, a season of the dark night of the soul. If there's anything that can comfort you, it'd be two things. One, you're not alone. You're not the only one that's gone through it. Uh, As Easy made reference to the Psalms are full of Psalms of lament. As a matter of fact, Google the Psalms of lament, pull them out and read them. Find solace so that you're not the only one that cries out to the Lord in that kind of a way. Uh, and often in those Psalms of lament, there will all be all of these unanswered questions. Where are you, O Lord? Why is this happening, O Lord? Why is my soul grieving, O Lord? And more often than not, those Psalms end with, uh, even though he's not answering them in the moment, though I will trust you. I will trust you and lament, godly lament never leads to sin. And uh, so I hope that you find solace in, in those Psalms as you're through this you season. Know, I always I rush the Psalms to soak my soul in it when I'm going through a tough time. They're just so attractive yeah. and they're so, such a balm. Yeah. yeah. You got one, Mark? What is something you know now that you wish you knew when you were younger? Hmm. I was younger when the program started. <laughs> <laughs> Friends. <laughs> Keep sending in your, uh, your questions, by the way, uh, and keep, keep connecting us with, with us there. Like, what would you share with a 17-year-old, freshly born again, Emil Zwayne? Yeah. You know, I think what I, would, what I would have done or wish that I had knowledge of as an, a younger believer uh, are two books that have really revolutionized my life. Uh, one is called... Uh, the, the Discipline of Grace by Jerry Bridges. 
that deals with the balance between uh, discipline and dependency. And he talks about the two wings of, of the airplane, which we've shared before. If the pilot said, hey, which one would you like to would you like us to get rid of, the right one or the left one? That's a stupid question because it doesn't matter which one. If, if one of the wings is gone, you're, the plane's going down. So you must have discipline, uh, but you also must have dependency on the Lord. But those have to, have to coexist. But he just gives such a great balance of, of who we are in Christ and, and the security of our salvation, but then our call to walk in obedience. And then another book that was inspired by that book is one by Milton Vincent called The Gospel Primer. Uh, or primer, people say it in different ways, but powerful, powerful book. That, that kind of springboards off of that one, that changed his life, and then he wrote this, and it has practical ways of how the gospel applies to life. And that's the real thrust of, of both books, is to preach the gospel to, your life, to yourself every day and to live from the gospel. The gospel isn't just the, the, the tool through which we're saved, it's the, it's the, the uh, treasure that we live out of. We're constantly taking from the gospel and applying the benefits to our lives as believers. Yeah. So preaching the gospel to yourself every day, walking in that dependency and that discipline. I, uh, I, yeah. Those are good. Um, Claudia Amin, we're gonna get to your questions soon. I like that one. Uh, but before that, One Life, One Fire says, since God knew from before starting humanity that he would be throwing billions of souls into hell, why would he start humanity? Yeah, For reasons known only to him, right? It's the ultimate answer even to the problem of evil. If God is so loving and all-powerful, why is there evil and suffering in the world? For reasons known only to God, he allows certain things to take place, right? Let him who glories glory in this, that they know me, that they understand me. I, I don't understand. Well, wisdom is not understanding all of God's ways, but rather it's responding to trials God's way. So we understand that God is in control. We know that God is doing. For whatever reason, God does what he does. And that's enough for me. And why is that enough for me? Because once you understand the attribute and the character of God, you can truly say in the midst of the storm, it is well with me. I can mock the tumultuous storm around me because I know the weatherman. So I don't know why God does what he does, but that's okay. Yeah. I'm going to allow God to be God, and I'm going to fall into line. I'm going to think God's thoughts after him, as Greg Bonson said. I'm going to allow him to do what he needs to do, and I'm going to follow him. That's my calling is to follow. That's good. Yeah, uh, as, as Mark alluded to, we're actually going to be recording a podcast. It'll probably be episode 13 or 14, and the focus will be on hell. But let me just uh, add to what you just said. I think uh, Romans 1 gives us a very interesting perspective on hell. Uh, over and over again, Romans 1 says, for this reason, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. And then uh, it says again later on that he delivered them over. He says it about two or three different times. And so it gives us this picture that, that God's common grace and patience for everybody, believer and non, is that he is wooing you towards him, that he has you alive and that you are breathing air because he wishes that nobody should perish. And yet we are constantly sinners that have not been saved by grace are choosing to rebel against him, choosing to deny God. And when we deny God, we deny his glory. We deny because we are image bearers. We deny uh, being human. What it means to be human is to be an image bearer of God. And so what that ends up doing is, is by denying God, hell or eternity is basically a perpetual of us choosing not God. Uh, J.A. Packer says it like this, scripture sees hell as self-chosen. Hell appears as God's gesture of respect for human choice. All receive what they actually choose, either to be with God forever worshiping him or without God forever worshiping themselves. It is in our natures wow to choose not God and that, and so I would say there's, there's an aspect of your question that is being asked in the wrong kind of way. Yeah, and, and remember again that because we don't understand something, it doesn't negate its reality. There's a lot of things we understand that we don't understand that we know are, and a lot of times this is the thing that causes people to say, I don't want anything to do with Christianity. Well, think of what you're doing. A lot of times in that sense, you're saying, right. well, then God isn't real. Why? Because uh, he created you know, all these people that are going to go to hell. Well, are you saying that's wrong? 
And if that's wrong, by what objective, right. transcendent, and immutable standard are you basing that on, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so it, in the same breath, a lot of these people will say, oh, there's no such thing as, as absolute truth or absolute morality. <laughs> morality is relative. Okay, well, if morality is relative, then what's your problem with that, you know? So you have to understand that if it wasn't for the things we don't understand about God that should amaze us, there would be no such thing as awe. There would be no, no such thing as, as exuberant worship to say, Lord, you are so beyond us. Think our little pea brains. You know, it's like an ant trying to understand the complexities of neuroscience, you know, or, or the complexity of nuclear energy. It's, it's impossible. You know, our, an old pastor friend of ours used to say, you know, when you come across something you don't understand, you fall back on that which you do understand. Yeah. I don't understand all the areas and aspects of God, but that doesn't keep me from following Him and serving Him and worshiping Him and loving Him. Just in the same way, I don't understand exactly how my digestive system works, but it doesn't keep me from eating. Yeah. Here's ultimately the reason why we were created. Isaiah 43, verse 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed, and made. Why were we created? Why did God create the world? Everything for one reason, for His glory. That's Amen. Good. Yeah, so friends, keep sending in your questions. And when you do, if you could put where you're from, the area you're from, the you know, like state that. or whatever, that would really be cool too. Um, here's one from uh, Leah Hamada. Uh, she asked, uh, I am an introvert. What should I do about sharing the gospel with my friends and family? Ray, how would you advise an introvert? Uh, um, I'm an introvert, seriously, I'm an introvert, but um, love conquers that. Love isn't concerned about self. An introvert person is concerned about what people think, uh, concerned about me and fears. And um, Treat it the same way you treated life. You began by crawling, then you stood up and walked, and you ride a bike, drive a car, start crawling. That, by that I mean just leave a track lying around. Sometimes I go to a supermarket and I take the how to be free from the fear of death track and just leave it on a shelf and give one to the checkout as I'm checking out. And you can do that and then you'll just progress to a point where you give one to someone and say, do you think there's an afterlife? So that's how I do it. That's and I, 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 there's very few people that are super bold. Uh, easier, are, are you sh shy sometimes? Or oh, you? yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah um, I deal with, with with that, anxiety, fear of man, cr crazy thoughts going through our minds. Um, and I love what you always say, Ray, that, that anxiety or courage is not the absence of fear, it's the conquering of it. And sometimes yeah. we can give that impression, we've always got to get, yeah, sometimes I feel very bold, very courageous. Um, you know, I am an extrovert, and so it, of course, interacting with people isn't a problem for me. But it's spiritual, it's more than just our personality. This is what we have to remember. In fact, there's a lot of people I think that our extroverts never had an issue with people, and then they get saved and they're going to share the gospel, and it's <laughs> yeah. like, uh, it's bizarre, but there's a spiritual dynamic. There's an enemy of our souls. One of Satan's biggest tactics is to get you to just not realize his reality. But we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's what it says, right? Ephesians 6. Uh, and that's why we have to take up the armor of God yeah. and and press through that, push through that, right? I mean, that's really been your life for the past 50 years. Mm. It's been pushing through despite what you feel. Yeah, um, it's like you're a soldier of Christ, or a, as I often said, a firefighter doesn't go by his feelings. He doesn't get to work one day and there's a <clears throat> fire and people are trapped. He doesn't say, I'm just gonna take the day off because he's committed to be a firefighter and you're committed to be a Christian, a soldier of Christ or someone who pulls sinners from the fire, hating him with the garment spotted by the flesh. Yeah. One of the biggest keys for me is get a dog, put sunglasses on, go for a walk <laughs> and take some tracks with you and strangers will come up to you and you won't, they won't talk to you, they'll talk about the dog to you, yeah. which takes the the every eye off you and onto the dog, and that really helps. If yeah. you haven't got a dog, get a cat and put a... So, oh, yeah. do not get I'm a cat. Sorry. I, uh, <laughs> I, I w people are surprised that my natural disposition is to be an introvert as well. Uh, I gain energy by reading books and sitting at home by myself and enjoying music. That's where I feel most energized, and I expend energy in public. And so what I would say to that is, um, first and foremost, our our personalities and dispositions um, do not give us uh, a way out of what God commands for us. So I, th I think about it, anything, you can't, we never wanna say to ourselves or to God, well, I'm, 
I'm more like this, therefore I'm not gonna do that, right? Uh, even in the midst of your introvertedness, trust me, I know, God desires to use you uh, for his glory in the sense of evangelism. Yeah. We have a question from Claudia. I, I, I said earlier that we would get to Did it. Did say where she's from? Or? She didn't, it was from earlier before you asked them okay. to do that. But she asks advice for singles. I thought this was a good one because you guys have young children now that are in the courtship uh, uh, age range and you guys are counseling and discipling them through that. And I appreciate all of the advice and counsel I've seen you give your kids. I've gleaned from it. My kids are a little bit younger than that but also we've all been single. So what is your general advice for singles? Yeah, Mark, you have a newly engaged son. I, I do. Um, my advice is the same thing that I would say to me if I had the chance to go back in time and talk to a 19-year-old Mark Spence. Redeem the time. And the same thing I would say to a 49-year-old Mark Spence. Redeem the time. But for a 19-year-old Mark Spence, a single Mark Spence, there are many things that I would do. I would engulf myself in the meditation of God's word, in evangelism, in apologetics, and learning the guitar for family devos. Uh, I would study, study church history. I would get all of these things really engulfed down at that age because things get a little tighter as you get older. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have the, the, the time to be able to learn guitar perhaps as you get older or study church history. Things become kind of focused on a, on a singular aspect. Yeah. That's what I do. Yeah, and, and also try to uh, understand that you have the opportunity to do things that non-single people are, or married people are, people in relationships are, that, that you can't do. That's why Paul talked about that, right? About a person who's married, they're thinking about worldly things, how they can please their wife or their husband, but the one who isn't is undistracted. They can seek to please the Lord. So I think a big problem is, is a lot of single people waste a lot of mm. precious time because they're anxious about getting married. And I understand, I have compassion. There, there are some that are in, in their 30s, 40s, 50s that aren't married and they long to be married. And I know it's painful, I know it's hard, but this is where we yield and surrender to the Lord, you know, and understand that He's, he's sovereign and He loves us and we focus on eternity, but make the most of your time because if the Lord does bring someone around, you're gonna look back and say, I wasted all this time I, yeah. instead of using it for the Lord. So how could you practically use that time for the Lord? Yeah, well, like Mark said, you know, I mean, another thing I would tell my young self, yeah, is, is it, just inundate yourself with truth constantly. Memorize. Memorize scripture, scripture uh, listen to, to sermons, study, study the word, do something like learn Greek and Hebrew. I know it sounds crazy, but... And share the gospel. And share the time. gospel. Have an inlet, have an outlet. Don't grow yeah. stagnant. Uh, and, and have a, you know, and pray. Have more of a vibrant prayer life. That's the first thing that we neglect. And I think it's the barometer that shows where we're really at with the Lord. Because prayer is one of the hardest things to do along with evangelism. Yeah. But pour your heart out to God. The fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. Jesus prayed constantly and he'd spend all night in prayer. If anyone didn't need prayer, it was Jesus. But to have a life, because that creates communion with you and the Lord and in tandem with the word, right? Hear from God through the word, speak to God through yeah, prayer. Yeah, I, I would just say that um, I love all of that. And I would also say that singleness is not a waiting room. You're not waiting around to experience life through marriage. Uh, you are no less uh, important or valuable because you are a single woman or a single man. God has you where he wants you uh, and singleness is a blessing from the Lord and it's important for us to, while marriage is something to desire and esteem is a good thing, uh, it can also become an idolatrous thing. It can become something that robs us of our joy if we're not there because we're waiting so much for it. And so to be able to, in the midst of redeeming your time, to be able to recognize your value and worth as a single person and enjoy the season that God has you in, whether that's a short season or a long season, to enjoy and trust the Lord with his calling on your life, which right now, if you're single, then your calling is to be single. And right. when he calls you to something else, then praise God, hallelujah, he calls you to something yeah. else. Amen. Well, I have another question here, but my, our producer wants me to remind you all that are watching that this is, this is not a regular thing we're doing today in terms of a YouTube live with the podcast. We're testing this out. Uh, we may start doing this in the future, but if you wanna get this kind of content, 
check out the podcast, right? The Living Waters podcast, it's on every major platform and uh, connect with us and you'll be able to get this on a weekly basis. New ones uploaded all the time, so. All right, this question uh, raised from Bryant the D- D- Bryant the Giant. Ooh, I like that. Bryant the <laughs> Giant. That's a cool um, last name. Yeah. And the question is tracts to give out while I'm doing my bicycle evangelism. Which Ray, your experience with? What's what's the best tract to give out while you're doing? Um, bicycle? take a hundred um, million dollar pills and just let them go. <laughs> <laughs> Ray, you're probably uh, the biggest litter bug that's ever lived <laughs> with your tracks and your millions. Yeah, any track really. Um, we've got a, a selection, livingwaters.com. You pick one that you think you'd like. Um, one of my favorites is uh, how to be free from the fear of death because everyone's thinking about the fear of death because of COVID. They're being confronted by that appointment. And uh, I, I, I've always been hesitant to give it out, but nobody rejects it. They mm. say, oh, thank you very much. And so, uh, and the million dollar bill is always a, a good one to give out. No one rejects that. I would say pick a track that you would enjoy receiving. As, as much as our tracks are designed for non believers, it's so important that as a believer, you enjoy handing that track out. Like you guys love that, uh, the track about the doctor. Every time you pick up and read that, both you, uh, Ray, and Easy, you bust up laughing in it. And that's what makes that track enjoyable to give away. If you enjoy the track yourself, it's a good sign that you should probably have it. That's why we have the track sample pack, right? Just one of all the tracks. Figure out which track uh, works for you. Um, Oh, and the uh, starter kit which is a new box too, which is the- 350 uh, tracks? 350 tracks of our most popular tracks in the starter kits right on the homepage. Yeah. Uh, Oh wait, Ray, did you mention the coin? For riding your bike? Oh, that's right. I, uh, I, <laughs> for years, I carried a whole stack of them. I'd just toss them to people as I went past. And you'd hear them clunk because they're not made of plastic. They're made of metal. I think they're aluminum or something. Yeah. So it would clunk on the ground, have perceived uh, value when it clunked, and people would pick it up as I was going past And this is, our, this is our Ten Commandments coin. It's got the Ten Commandments on one side, and on the other side, it has a little gospel message. How'd you get a gospel message on a coin? It was very difficult. I did it with my teeth. Yeah. Should Christians oh, celebrate teeth. Halloween? What do they do with Halloween on that night of Halloween? I don't know who said it, but I wrote down the question. Yeah. Should a Christian celebrate Halloween? What do we do on that night? Yeah, absolutely not. Uh, not celebrate Halloween. We know it's pagan roots and... and Is it hollow or hollow? I tomato, hollow, tomato? Hollow, yeah. potato, potato. It's, uh, it's uh, schmallow. Too, yeah. Too schmallowing. Yeah, don't celebrate it, but use it, as we often say, mm. as national evangelism day, yes. <laughs> right? It's This is one of the greatest days to share the gospel with the lost. So we the got acronym, a video The acronym ago. for that? Uh, what was that? The acronym for that, National Evangelism Day? Uh, not your friend, no. <laughs> yeah, it's Ned. <laughs> <laughs> Ned. <laughs> Hang out with your homeboy Ned on Halloween. But no, I mean, think about that. How often do strangers come to your door so you can share the gospel with them? So have some And they're candy. wanting something. They've yeah, got little baking something. bags for you. So don't tracks. just give them a gospel trek either, right? How, do yes. you, how no, no. should you hand out the gospel trek? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as believers, we should get the best candy, not the cheap... Uh, like the big candy know. bars. Yeah, the big ones, the big candy bars, the, you know, the M&M bags. No, the, no, no, no. What are you talking about? Starburst. You give them broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> we care about their health. Yeah, we Chocolate care about their health. The broccoli. Brussels sprouts. Yes. Uh, well, but yeah, put them, put them, and you, you put them in a little Ziploc and then put some tracks in there. Yeah. But notice so what you, you said there, it. right? We need to grab the track and put it inside of a bag with the candy bar. Don't give them a candy bar and a track because it goes right. inside the mix and yeah, all they yeah. find is Put the them track. together in a bag. Put them in a bag. And I give a track with every piece of bacon. That's what <laughs> we do. Um, and then also we have, we have the curved illusions, the Halloween curved illusions are black and orange. I think we have them this year. Or do we trick or treat. Uh, you're going to start we do. doing oh, your we voice in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we have a video, friends. Look it up. It's no, me, Ray, don't have Mark. to, though. It's the best. <laughs> it's it's got 150,000 views. Give it's all you, though, yeah. watching it over and over again. Give your kids nightmares. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but no, the curved illusions that that, for, that we have for Halloween, uh, they're black and orange. Kids love them. You could do that for them at the door, give them to them. So, uh, yeah. And the giant it. money just makes them boggle with your eyes. Yeah. Use it for the gospel. It's such a great opportunity for you to get to know your neighbors. So often, depending on where you live, even in a cul-de-sac, everybody comes home and they shut their door and no one knows the neighbor. You know, I would venture to guess that half of America doesn't know their next door neighbor's names. I'd venture to give the vast majority of Americans don't know five doors down their neighbor's names. And uh, Halloween 
Um, I agree with you guys. It's got pagan roots. Uh, but it does present us with a great opportunity to know our neighbors. We host a potluck in our back in our back driveway area on Halloween, and so we just tell all the parents, hey, when you're tired of walking around with the kids, come over here and have a meal with us, and we hand out tracts and share the gospel that way. So oh, it's just wonderful. a tremendous opportunity yeah. Oh, yeah. to get out use there. It, use it for the gospel's sake, yeah. Connie Fitzgerald. Hi, Connie. Um, it doesn't say where she's from. She's from the internet. She says... Why do churches teach that we are made in the image of God when the Bible says we are born sinners and Jesus must be, uh, and we must be born again? Connie, churches teach that we are made in God's image because the Bible says that we are made in God's image. It's, it's, and, and you're absolutely right, uh, we are born sinners, but it's valuable to understand that the, that, that, uh, the theology of man is that we are created to glorify God by reflecting his image because we are uniquely created in God's image. Adam and Eve were not born sinners. They were born perfect image bearers. And in the fall, they chose to rebel against God, therefore falling short of his glory and disrupting, distorting their image bearing quality. And we have inherited Adam and Eve's sin. Therefore, we are born sinners. But a part of the gospel isn't that just that we are saved from our sins, it's actually that we are redeemed, redeeming me or reconciled uh, back to what we were originally meant to be, back to being image bearers of God, made perfect in his image for his glory. Uh, that's a, that's a, a core tenet of the faith of who we are to be human. Uh, we are created in God's image, but we fall short of his glory through our sin, because of what Adam and Eve did. And here's the scriptures. Oh yeah, I was about that. to share the scriptures. <laughs> uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 27, I won't read it, but you can look it up, Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Genesis 5, verses one to two. Genesis 9, verse six. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. And then I'd also throw in a couple more that kind of reflect that as well. Ephesians 4, 24 and James 3, 9. I'll deal with the image of God. Easy. Yeah, and, and again, I think it is worth reading Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then he gave dominion and it says, uh, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And that's, that's heavy. And, and remember though, you, you might say, oh, well, that's pre-fall. But what Mark cited in Genesis 9, this is after the fall. This is after the flood. This is God speaking to Noah. And he says, whoever sheds the blood of man by man, his blood shall be shed for God made man in his own image. So the image isn't lost. Sure, it's, it's been, it's been marred distorted and, disrupted. and marred into face because of sin. But that's why we're being conformed to the image of Christ. Right? And we do have a, an entire podcast that we recorded on Imago Dei. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's on Which the hasn't podcast. come out yet, I believe. Uh, I think that one will probably be episode 9 or 10. Uh, so you go and subscribe to the Living Waters podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, whatever you choose. Hit the subscribe and uh, take a listen to the Imago Dei episode. We spent about 45 minutes dissecting that theology and showing how we can use it in an evangelistic setting. Yeah. Okay, this is from Missy E uh, from the UK, from London. Uh -huh. uh, thanks, Missy. We, we appreciate you tuning in from there. Fist and chips. What do you got? Fist and what? Fist and chips. No, you said fist yes, and Alan. chips. Yeah, 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 I heard it. Uh, uh, tuna, YouTube. Uh, okay, Miss E. See the trials. Uh, what, what do you guys think about the spiritual realm and how it relates to anxiety slash depression? That's a good question because we talked about, you know, practical trials and stuff. But what about the spiritual realm? Well, God's not given us the spirit of fear. I notice it says the spirit of fear. So you can have the spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. That's what you have to stand on. And we know Legion, when he was uh, delivered of the demonic realm, um, came clothed, sitting and in his right mind. Mm. And that's what you have in Christ. So oh, it's a spiritual battle. We've got to remember that and then pick up all the armor that God gives us in Ephesians chapter 6. Yeah, that's good. You know, I'd like to, uh, Edward Welch, I uh, highly recommend his writing, but in his book, Depression, A Stubborn Darkness, he makes uh, two observations concerning people that are feeling hopeless in today's life. He said, one, if you're hopeless, there may be many contributors, but two are certain. Number one, 
you've placed your hope in something other than God, and it's let you down. And two, you may understand that Jesus conquered death, but you live as though he is still in the grave. Hmm. All hopelessness is ultimately a denial of the resurrection. We must always remember that our Redeemer is bigger than our past, and what God desires to do in the present is even greater than what we desire to do inside the present. So there, there, there's a lot going on, right? And I choose to do like what you, what you had shared earlier with R. Kent Hughes, I, to open up God's Word because for me it becomes my ultimate sanity in a world that's gone awry. Things are getting crazier and crazier by the millisecond, mm -hmm. and the only thing that will stand true is God's Word. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth, John 17, 17-ish, 17 right around there. We, we have to continually run to him who is truth if we don't want to listen to the lies of this world. Every billboard has been photoshopped. Every counseling appointment has been given half the facts. But with God's word, we can put our guard down. We can sit on our hands, and it becomes for us, as Arkan Hughes said, our ultimate sanity. Amen. I love that. And, and, and our Kent Hughes said to, that to us in person when he came yeah. here to the ministry and then we went to lunch with him. And uh, Ray's pastor was with us and he asked him, yeah. you know, that, a question that related to that. And he said, that's... Why have you written 22 commentaries? You've written so much. You know the words so well. Why? And his reason was because the Bible is my ultimate sanity in a world that was falling apart. Wow. That's so good. All right. Uh, here is one from Veritas de Vincent. Uh, how is it do we? Veritas or Veritas? <laughs> it's Veritas. Veritas. We're not in New Zealand, right? <laughs> Veritas. Veritas. Oh, what was one of the words you do? Burrito. It sounds like you're saying burritos, <laughs> or maybe I just hear everything as Veritas. burritos. Uh, okay. How do we know when to share the gospel and when it's a lost cause? Casting a pearl before swine. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. If the person's breathing, share the gospel. Amen. <laughs> True. At what point and do you walk away? When they're not breathing. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't mean you killed them, does it, Ram? No. no. Okay, good. Um, uh, yeah, no, but, but I think that's a valid question in terms of, okay, we know you should, I have a, you know, evangelism principles and the W is witness willingly to whosoever. And, you know, we need to be ready and willing to share. But when do we know when? www. What? What are you guys doing over there? Nothing. <laughs> Whosoever. You guys are bad people. We are. Uh, uh. But, but when, when, do we, when do we know that, Ray, it's casting pearl before swine and we need to stop or whatever? Yeah, if someone, sorry, someone's blaspheming God and spitting at you and uh, um, using filthy language and say, I don't want to hear, then that's it. Yeah. But if that same person stops and says, okay, give me a best shot, yeah. I would give it a best shot. Yeah, I would say there's, there's no such thing as a lost cause. Um, God, God will surprise you on who you might save. There were plenty of people that had conversations with me that were like, that is the last person. So you were an atheist. Christian. I was an atheist for an extended period of time. I was a militant atheist. I love having conversations with Christians and uh, uh, to try to trip them up in their own faith. And I, I can't, I would love to interact with somebody that shared the gospel with me back in the day today. Um, so there are no lost causes. The Pearl Before Swines, as you alluded to, is about having a conversation with somebody who is in a state of irrationality and disrespect. Are they a lost cause? No, but in that moment, in that state of mind, the way that they're arguing and discussing with you, they're, you're, 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 they're not interested in what you have to say. They're not being reasonable. <laughs> and you can trust the Lord with, hopefully somebody else will be able to present the gospel to them in a better situation. I can think of a lost cause. Uh, it was one guy that went around killing Christians and imprisoning them and holding the cloaks of those who stoned people to death mm. for their faith. Uh, if we had, you know, would you witness the apostle. Saul? Of, would Sorry, you talk to Saul of Tarsus? Would you share the gospel? Absolutely not. He's a... Just a, a, a wicked, evil, murderous, bloodthirsty wretch. Yeah, uh -huh. and some did that because in Acts nine it says that when they started, when the disciples started bringing him in, around after he became a Christian, yes. they're like, "Isn't that the guy that was murdering all the Christians? You want him to come into my house?" Like they were worried about him. So there's no yeah. lost cause because if anyone Absolutely. was, he was. Yeah, uh, yeah. Paul talks in Galatians. He says the, the believers are saying, "Isn't he the one who, who you know?" persecuted us and then the heat, they said and they glorified God in me Isn't that like wonderful? wow and um, I love when Ananias um, was asked to pray for him and he says oh, no no you know, God Jesus said this guy Saul of Tarsus or Paul's going to come and he says but Lord he's a, and Jesus took no notice of him because he he doesn't see sin but as soon as he prayed for him he began with brother Saul oh I love that brother 
What yeah. a wonderful thing. That's beautiful. Yeah, oh, and I just remembered uh, my... Uh, What's up there? Over there, yep, yeah, right, look over there, over there. Uh, the P principle in my, because I took the alphabet and made each letter an alliterated uh, principle for sharing the gospel. And actually the P one, not that you guys are listening or anything, Sorry. What? but the P, the P principle was pile none of your precious priceless pearls in the pig pen. <laughs> That's not funny. Oh boy. Here we go again. You see friends what I have to put up with every day. Okay, um, any more questions? Well, Plenty. there's lots of questions, right? I mean... Um, can you please list reasons why you would not join a church? <laughs> Says Rita Merritt. What are some reasons why you wouldn't join that church, it was but named, you may join that church? If it was named Latter-day Saint. <laughs> Latter-day Saint. <laughs> but if there's women pastors, they're not pastors, they're just women in front of the congregation. right? So I wouldn't join a church that has a woman pastor. I, wouldn't, uh, I, I would want to join a church that's going to teach the Word from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. I'm really looking for a church that's going to exposit so I'm I think for, it'd be more beneficial to ask what church would you join? And yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a good question, right? And if your choices are limited, though, mm. right, well, what do you do? What, what if you live in some remote area where you don't have any other option? What if, I mean, there's, there's mm. I saw there, there's a guy from India. I assumed it was a guy from India, and maybe there's not a lot of choices. Whereas we only have to, if we don't like the church right next to us, we have to look behind them 100 yards, and we're going to yeah. find another church. Right, so it's easy for us to find a church, a good church. But what now signifies a, a bad church? I definitely yeah. wouldn't join a prosperity church. Yeah, wouldn't join the prosperity, word, faith, um, church, definitely. Uh, wouldn't join a legalistic church. Mm. Wouldn't church, join an antinomian church. You which know, means? Which means a church that is just, uh, loose with you know, sin. loose with righteousness. And, and, and they're, they look like the world and they're indulging in carnality. There's no love for righteousness and holiness. And a pro-abortion pro church or a pro-sexual yeah. yeah. right. church. Right, or a church that doesn't speak, you know, hit the hard things, that takes a stand. A church that, I would avoid a church that doesn't take a stand on things that the, the Bible's clear on, homosexuality, transgenderism. And I'm not talking about a harsh church. I'm talking about a church that, because they love their, their community, speaks the truth in love uh, and with compassion. The yeah. Nine Marks website is, again, we reference it often. It's a great website to go to and yeah. try to find a church. Yeah, and Mark, I know. Martin? Mark Dever, yeah, Nine Marks. He just called me the other night. Yeah. Did he? Oh, really? Nice guy, yeah. What yeah. did he call you? All sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Grace Community uh, Church, uh, the Master's College, I know they have a, a, a list of churches affiliated with them. It's a, just a great, sound, biblical uh, movement that deals with uh, expositing Scripture and giving the whole counsel of God. You saying something, right? I sent you a text about something very private that I didn't even want brought up. Oh, let me read it. Podcast. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> All right, so, so you had brought up you wouldn't attend a church where the pastor is welcoming towards homosexuals. Are homosexuals just not allowed? No, no, church? definitely Define not. Define that, yeah. Fully welcomed. Fully welcomed. Fully welcomed to come in to hear the word. Not allowed to, to become members of the church. Right. And, and not allowed to feel comfortable in the church that, oh, they're great, they approve it. Right. There if they're there for a, a certain amount of period of time, it, it should, they should understand that this church has a biblical view of sexuality, of marriage, of, of you know, God-given genders. Uh, it's, it's not much different than somebody who's practicing premarital sex, yeah. living right. with their girlfriend and Adultery. sleeping with her every night. Of course you're going to welcome them to the church. Of course you want them to sitting in the pews. Of course you're going to preach the gospel to them and invite them to a meal afterwards and, and pray for them and, and hope to see repentance. Uh, it's, it's similar. At the same time, to, to your point that you alluded to, uh, you want to go to a church that understands the difference between someone who is attending and a member who is faithfully committed to God's word who has been born again. Yeah. And, and they're not going to be serving Who won't choke to death in the middle you know, of the podcast. And that's, you know, that's where the confusion comes in, where... <laughs> Uh, you okay, Ray Comfort? That made me laugh. <laughs> oh, did he? Yeah. Turn so how do you, turn here's your microphone from off, Ray Comfort. Joshua Kowalski asked. He's down. How do you share with someone who is trans? How do you share the gospel with somebody who is homosexual? How do you share the gospel with someone? Ultimately, they said it was trans. How do you share the gospel with a homosexual, Ray? Or right. of that? Well, he doesn't have his mic on. I'm trying to find it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll answer for Ray. In the same way, you share the gospel with anybody. Right. Uh, and that's the beauty of it, right? That despite their homosexuality, despite their transgenderism, despite their 
fornication, even if they're heterosexual. There's plenty of other sins that you can point out. And uh, of course, if it comes up in the course of the conversation or they allude to it or say something about it, or you definitely then get specific with them in that. Are you guys even listening? No, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 10 deals with that. The law was made for homosexuals and sinners and lists all yeah. those it was made for. Yeah. So just take them through the commandments. Don't have to talk about their sexual orientation. You don't want to know about it anyway. You just show them they've sinned against God and they need a savior by going through the commandments. Yeah. Amen. And, and again, Ray, I've heard you though, in the course of the conversation, as it comes up, you'll allude to it and you'll say, you know, homosexual will not inherit the kingdom of God, it says in 1 Corinthians 6. Oh, wait till they've got a humbled heart if they've yeah. got the fur back up and they're ready for you. But once they see you, you care about them and you're concerned right. for their salvation, then you can show them the scriptures that say neither adulterers, fornicators, liars, etc. Yeah, Mark, can. real quick, um, can you share that story uh, <clears throat> about uh, on the plane? That was me. No. Yeah. No, the guy in the Olympics, Mark. The guy oh, who won the, the Olympics. Olympics. Yeah. I thought the other one. The. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> now it's Oscar's turn to leave. Uh, yeah, listen, I, I was on a plane uh, several years ago next to a guy who just finished winning a gold medal in the Olympics. And he was traveling alone, and there was a guy that was by the window who was listening in on our conversation. And it came out in the conversation that the guy who won the gold medal in the Olympics was also gay. He had said that his partner wasn't able to join him, and when he goes back to San Francisco, his partner was going to be so proud of him, and he was going to present the medal to him. So coming back from Chicago, I had the chance to share the gospel with him, and I did not bring up his alternative lifestyle in the midst of the conversation. And as we begin to land, he had said, you never brought up, you never mentioned my homosexuality. What are you saying I need to do? And I said, <laughs> you know what you need to do. And he said, you're right. And when I get back home, when my, if my partner doesn't move out, I will. Wow. And there's the power of the gospel, right? He reaches it. this pinnacle of success. Nobody better than him in his he endeavors. He won a gold, He said? won a gold medal. He had wow. it on, um, on the plane. It was he allowed, he allowed it? me to put it. Yeah, he allowed me to put it on. Wow. I go, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take off with it. He's like, you yeah, well, there's You didn't do a selfie? This is before selfies. Yeah, before selfies. <laughs> I didn't even actually think about it. But when he said he was a homosexual, the guy by the window leaned away from him. Wow. I actually leaned into him. I put my arm around him and I said, I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of what you accomplished. I'm honored to be sitting next to you. Remember, mm -hmm. this guy is created in the image yep. of God. This guy does not have some plague. And but by the grace of God, there go I and mm -hmm. you and her, everybody, yeah. right? So you share the gospel and you allow the cards to fall. Yeah. Them. And if you go to our YouTube channel, there's a video <laughs> on there called Compelled by Compassion. Just put, if you put it in the search on YouTube and my name, Emil Zwin or whatever, it'll come up. But, but I share a story uh, about which I, I dialogued with a man on Facebook that had put in a comment and he was had a homosexual lifestyle. And you can get a kind of a fly in the wall experience of how I interacted with him. And then in the end, he ended up repenting. And then he changed his Facebook profile picture from his picture to our, to our uh, Audacity movie, uh, you know, graphic. At uh, fullyfreefilms.com. It deals, free deals with homosexuality at fullyfreefilms.com. Uh, I thought you were referring to my experience coming home from Seattle when I sat next to the two, uh, the, two the, the couple who were two females and they had a, a baby with them that they had adopted. Oh, yeah, uh, I forgot about that. Uh, so that was, I was, I was reading uh, Christ and Culture Revisited by D.A. Carson and I was kind of, you know, when they first sat next to me, I was having fun with the little baby. They were relieved to see that I wasn't gonna be grumpy about this little yeah. kid crying. I was making him laugh and stuff. And then we take off and we're in the air and you know, I tend to read when I'm on the plane. So I'm like, oh man, are they gonna be, are they gonna have to be weird about the title? I mean, if you look at the title of the book, it's huge, Christ in culture, you know? <laughs> so I open up and I read it and I notice the more masculine one sitting at the end, I'm on the window. And so uh, the more feminine one kind of taps her on the shoulder, she looks and she's just like, oh, and I can like sense it. And I'm like, oh man. <laughs> so we're like 30 minutes into the flight. I think it's two hours coming home from Seattle. Kind of like the length of your story. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to leave the program. You just you went destroyed on my for 45 my yeah, but that was me. <laughs> about some made up story. <laughs> <laughs> Enough about me, more about me. Yeah, yeah. So they, so, so anyways, she looks over at me and says something to the effect of like, so which kind of Christian are you? And it got like very stern very quickly. And, uh, 
I knew that I was gonna present the gospel to them, but I'm also sweating because it's like, I have an hour left on this plane. Are they gonna like, are these windows secure? Can they <laughs> kick me out, you know? And so I just said, well, you know, that's, there's like a lot more to that question than it might sound like. I said three things. One, and this is the, what I recommend everybody, respect, protect, and reject. One, to what Sleepy Mark was referencing, one, I respect you as a fellow human being, as an image bearer in God. And if anybody has ever been rude or disrespectful, or ever showed homophobic tendencies towards you, I stand with you and against that. I am not for that, and I'm sorry if that's ever happened to you. I respect the image bearing qualities in you. Two, I, as an American citizen, I want to protect uh, your rights in the same way that I would hope that you'd protect my rights. I don't want you to be thrown into prison for being homosexual. I don't want you to lose your house, whatever the case. Like I want to protect your rights and my rights together. Uh, but third, I, re I reject your perspective on sexuality. Hmm. You see it one way and I see it in the way that God designed for it to be. And I alluded, I, I went into a little bit further detail on that and then got to share the gospel with them. And thankfully, by the end of my long presentation, they were more gracious than Mark was. Uh, they were like, okay, all right, thanks for explaining that to us. We've never uh, heard it that way before. That's good. Mm. And I was sweating. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you, Ray. I mean, I, I've really been blessed by a lot of your encounters on our YouTube channel because so many conversations you'll have with homosexuals end very cordially. I think of Victoria, Victor, Victoria, the transgender. He was very grateful. He looked down at me and thanked me. Yeah. He's six foot and six. And we've had that a lot, yeah. you know? Six foot six. No, don't finish that. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So, well, guys, I think that, I think that does yeah, it. I think we're good. Yeah, unless you want to go on for another 15 minutes more. Let's yeah. do another couple hours. How's that? Well, thank you, friends, for Mark's bearing got, with Mark's us. Gotta go. Um, this has been this has been a joy. The first mm -hmm. time we, we do this in connection with the podcast, but we hope you enjoyed it. Again, uh, remember to go to our podcast uh, page if you call it that, uh, and and uh, what do you call it? Subscribe. Yeah, right now if if you have uh, Apple, you can go down. You can search your podcasting app for Apple Podcast, or if you listen to your music on Spotify, you can. Go on there. What we're asking for you to do is to subscribe to the podcast and uh, leave us a review. What that's going to do is going to help the podcast increase in its uh, in its ability to be found. Which, by the grace of God, more and more people will hear the gospel. More and more Christians will be inspired to proclaim the gospel, and more and more will come to a saving faith. So, subscribe through the Apple Podcasting or Spotify or anything else. Uh, and uh, leave a review. Yeah, rate it, leave a review, and uh, and share it with others. We hope you share this today. This is going to become a YouTube video in, in, in the regular video spot. Share it with other people. And uh, remember, check out Ray's books, The Ultimate Health Food, uh, Overcoming baklava. Panic Attacks, No Baklava for Oscar, and How to Overcome Life's Endless Trials, Valuable Lessons from the Life of Joseph. Mark Spence is a bad person. He's what about anxious. one of your poems, one of those long poems? Oh, who can tell me where I came from? The little boy would ask. So Mark, All right, friends. Mark had, Mark had to go. Yeah, let's let Mark go. That's a good thing. Thanks for joining us. And uh, if we do this again, we'll see you. But uh, tell others about the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I was going to text the staff and I said, would you go in the restrooms and lock the doors from the inside? <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Is that what he was said? Oh, he said he was bursting about 20 minutes ago. <laughs>